Edwards lowered his rifle musket from his shoulder and turned his head to face the sub-lieutenant. I don't want to shoot him, sir, he said. Voice quiet but firm. He gave a slight shake of the head when the officer turned to look at him. Sub-Lieutenant Dunbridge pursed his lips, but refrained from immediately asserting his authority over the corporal, as a younger or less experienced officer might have. Instead, he nodded thoughtfully and simply asked, Why is that? He could feel the eyes of the rest of the patrol, six veteran light infantrymen, regarding him, weighing, judging. The relationship between Dunbridge, the patrol's commander, and Ewart, the senior enlisted man, was a complex one. The sub-lieutenant held the superior rank who was over a decade older than Ewart, but was a reservist who had been recalled to the colours two years before. Corporal Ewart was only 23, but had five years of frontline combat experience and was a scout and patrol leader of established skill, a respected veteran. Fortunately, the two men's natures worked well together. Dunbridge was mature and sensible enough to defer to the corporal's expertise when the situation warranted. Ewart was wise enough not to push the boundaries of that deference. The upshot was that, if you had had concerns, Dunbridge was generally prepared to listen to them. Just... don't want to, sir. Don't seem right. The patrol was crouched in the winter-striped bush below the crest of a low ridge, far enough down to not be silhouetted against the sky behind them. All eight men were bundled in heavy grey greatcoats, knapsets on their backs, and the braid-trimmed kepis of Imperial Light Infantry pulled low against the snowy glare. All but Dunbridge bore long, muzzle-loading rifles held at the ready, their cruel spiked bayonets darkened with boot black, lest the glitter of steel reveal to them enemy eyes. Dunbridge, as an officer, held a double-barreled cavalry carbine just in front of the twin percussion locks, a more sensible and effective weapon for a patrol leader than the pistols and sabres of the more regular line infantry officers. Down below them, in a snow-covered meadow just beyond the frozen rails of a livestock fence, a group of enemy soldiers were kneeling at a tiny stream that are not fully frozen, rinsing mess kits and filling canteens. There were four of them, slender young men clad in tan-coloured jackets and trousers. Sturdy crossbows were slung to their backs, and the points of long, tapering ears stuck out through power blonde or silvery white hair. Dunbridge switched his gaze between the enemy, Ewart and the tree line behind the meadow. Do you suspect a trap? he asked, raising his field glasses. Those distant trees included many evergreens, and could conceal a full company of elvish archers without issue. It's not that, sir, Ewart replied, voice thick with something unexpressed. If there's more of them in those woods, they're too far away to support this lot. It's just... The couple chewed his lip for a moment. I don't feel like killing them. The elves started this war, muttered Grimsby, the rifleman besides Ewart. He didn't say this in the tone of argument, exactly. More like someone just raising an overlooked point. So they did, you had agreed. We're finishing it, ain't we? The truth of that statement was the very ground beneath their feet. Nearly 200 leagues inside the borders of the Elven Kingdom, two-thirds of the way to the enemy capital. A jerk of Ewer's nose indicated the elves below. But those lads didn't start it. They're all green as a company latrine after a case of the pea soup shits. Dunbridge, regarding the elves for his field glasses, grunted his agreement with that last. It was apparent, even from a distance, that the quartet down below were by no means veterans. Experienced troops would have posted one of their number with his weapon ready, as sentry, while the others worked, rather than all focusing on their canteens. Further, their movements, though full of that elvish grace that turned everything they did into a dance, were exaggerated and full of bravado for each other's sakes, rather than the efficient precision of soldiers in the field. Of course, the most obvious mark of their being newly minted conscripts was their weapons. When the Elven Kingdom had first invaded the Empire, their feared longbowmen had wrought havoc on the battlefields. Though of shorter effective range than the percussion rifle musket, a trained Elvish archer could get off ten arrows in the time it took an Imperial Line infantryman to load and fire once. Their terrifying war mages could deal magical destruction on the scale of a 40 pounder siege cannon, but with greater mobility and versatility. Between the arrow storms mowing down entire battle lines and magical fire, and lightning tearing apart defences, the Elvish invasion had been a true test of the Imperial Army's mettle. And yet. There was an old saying about archers, to train a good one, start with his grandfather. To achieve the level of mastery the Elvish bowmen possessed required countless hours of unstinting practice and dedication. 
The archers of the Elvish royal troop had all been plying their bows since they were old enough to lift one. They had never been anything but archers, for they could not afford to be. The average royal trooper was the combination of decade after decade of focused training combined with the most perfectly crafted weapons the Elven Kingdom could produce. Royal troopers were amazing warriors, tough, stealthy, resourceful, absolutely deadly to anything within range of their bows. Also irreplaceable. The Empire's factories could turn wood and iron into a percussion rifle musket in six days. Imperial trainers could teach the Royal's recruit to use one competently within six weeks. Likewise, the fearsome elvish war mage required rare talents that had to be carefully nurtured and guided by a century or more of specialised education to develop their full capabilities. And that was nothing compared to the investment required to probably equip a war mage for battle. A single magic staff, essential for a war mage to channel elvish manor into the physical world, was constructed of enough gemstones and other precious metals to pay for an entire battery of imperial field howitzers, horses and all. And a battery of field howitzers wouldn't be brought down by a single random bullet, or shit itself to death when drinking out of the wrong well. So while the Elvish invasion had struck hard, and left the humans of the Empire reeling, the calculus of the war had changed as it dragged on. The Elven Royal Troop and the Imperial Army had spent that first campaigning season hammering each other like impatient boxers, each throwing their hardest blows to try and gain the upper hand as quickly as possible. Casualties have been heavy, particularly for the humans, but the Empire had withstood the enemy's fury and held the Elves in the border provinces. The second campaigning season's opening has seen the Imperial forces reinforced back up to their old strength. And then, then some. And the Elves, not. The training program of the Royal Troop had, by utmost exertion, added 5,000 of the best archers the world had ever known to the Elvish host over that first winter. But the previous year's battles along the border had cost them over 100,000. By the end of that second campaigning season, the war had rolled back across the border into the Elflands, and the Royal Troop was being supplemented by lesser bowmen, militiamen, reservists, patriotic volunteers. The following year's fighting inside the vast Elven Kingdom saw the Royal Troop as a minority of their own army, and the first appearance of conscripts. These Elves had been pressed into service from other occupations, and, lacking the experience needed to make even marginally effective battlefield archers, had been armed with the similar to learn crossbow. These had about the same range and rate of fire as a low and smooth or musket, itself decades obsolete by Imperial standards, but were faster and simpler for the Elvish craftsmen to produce en masse. Now going into the war's fifth year, an elf with a longbow and an actual royal troop livery was a rare sight even in their own army. Aye, these chaps are green, muttered Colney, the rifleman at the far end of the line. Just boys, really, but boys on the wrong side of this matter. He sighed just a little. You're barely twenty yourself, Brendan Cully, the sub-lieutenant said, not quite hiding the amusement in his voice as he kept scanning the tree line. With respect, sir, the rifleman replied easily. I left my boyhood behind two campaigns ago. Fair enough. Dunbridge turned back to Ewart, who still had eyes on the elves. So what's your thought, Corporal? My true thought, sir? It's what I asked for. There was enough trust and respect between the two that if Dunbridge wanted honesty, Ewart could give it, and know he'd face no repercussions for doing so. My true thought, sir, is that the Elven Kingdom is a dead man walking, and this next campaign season will most likely bring the end to this war. And then I'll take in the lives of a handful of conscripts who had no part in starting this mess, and precious little effort on conducting it won't help nor hinder that in any way. The corporal turned eyes that were sad and wise beyond their 23 years to his officer. Do you disagree, sir? The silence went long enough that Ewart was not sure whether Dunbridge would answer him. The sub-lieutenant's field glasses had turned back to the quartet of elves, who were still mucking about with their pans and canteens in the water. One of the elves said something that made two of his comrades burst into laughter, while he gave an elbow nudge to the one beside him. That one replied by mashing a handful of snow into the comedian's face, which made the other two laugh all the harder. No, Dunbridge said at last, I don't disagree. He stuck his pipe between his teeth. Not lit, of course, because a soldier who smoked on patrol in the face of the enemy would probably not live to patrol again. But its presence, its heft, provided its own comfort. However, we have orders, Corporal, and those orders are to engage enemy partisan patrols. Dunwich's voice was mild, 
definite but mild. So they are, Ewers sighed, closing his eyes and letting his chin fall to his chest. But then he opened them and cocked his head at Dunbridge. But we have discretion, haven't we? Dunbridge took his pipe from his mouth and stared hard at Ewart. So we do, within reason. Ewart smiled a little, an expression Dunbridge has seen on the young man's face maybe four or five times in all the time they've worked together. He jerked his chin at a snowdrift downslope and to their left. See that, sir? If I get low behind that, I can follow that down to where the snow is heaped against the fence, and those lads won't see me until I'm right on top of them. No more attention than their pain. And what are you thinking now, Corporal? You would look back, frankly, unflinchingly, his rare smile turning a little sad. I'm thinking I'd like you to trust me, sir. Something about the sincerity of the Corporal's expression, a plea in those jaded, two old eyes, struck Dunbridge deeply, and he found himself nodding. All right. I'm entrusting this manoeuvre to you, Corporal Ewart. You may attempt your plan. Ewart turned to the rest of the squad. And you, lads. I'll be needing you to hold your tempers and don't do anything silly or abrupt unless this all goes to hell. You hearing me, Oxley? He pointed at a trooper in the middle of their line, Ginger and Freckle Face, who nodded. Fingers off triggers unless arrows start flying. What darkness are you planning, Tommy Ewart? The rifleman beside him grunted. Watching your see, Grimsby. It'll be a great laugh if I'm not killed in the attempt. We'll laugh even then, said Oxley with a wink. Because we're spiteful bastards, we are. Ewart set aside his knapsack, slung his rifle and eased out of the leafless bushes. The grey of his greatcoat had blended well with those sticks, but was light enough in hue that it didn't stand out much against the snow either. Moving carefully so as not to snap any branches or make any telltale crackling sounds from twigs or ice, you were slipped down slope and behind the snowdrift. Dunbridge let out a breath he hadn't realised he was holding. The owls were still working on those pans and canteens, none too diligently, it must be said. There was as much jostling and horseplay going on as actual work, and Dunbridge was suddenly struck by just how childish they appeared. Still, a child can pull a trigger and a crossbow bolt cares not who aims it or at whom. The odds of those elves, if they spotted you at actually hitting him with a crossbow shot, were low but they were not zero. Dunbridge had once seen an arrow, shot blindly by an elvish militia cavalryman who was retreating at full speed, glance off a wagon wheel, and take a popular young lieutenant colonel right in the throat. He'd gone from calling, Onward, fellows! The blighters are on the run! to drowning in his own blood in the space of seconds. So while you had made his way forward, Dunbridge had the other men keep their weapons at the ready. Fingers off triggers, as you had asked, but ready. Being a scout of great experience, Ewart was soon at the base of the little ridge, low behind the pile of snow and gliding quietly towards the fence and the little stream beyond it. One heard so much about the stealth and field craft of elvish foresters and royal troopers, but Dunbridge would not have cared to put money on a contest between one of them and Corporal Ewart. The man was positively ghostly when he wanted to be. What's he doing? muttered one of the riflemen, Walcut. Something stupid, I'm sure, Oxy replied. If he gets an arrow up the arse, we'll name him old Pricklebum until the day he dies. This brought a quiet chuckle from all of them, Dunbridge included. Amazingly, the elves still hadn't noticed Stuart, being entirely caught up in their task and their back and forth with each other. It astounded Dunbridge that troops could be so very unschooled in soldiering, so raw, so green. Had he ever been that green himself? He thought back to his youth and his mandatory year of officer training in the Imperial Provincial Reserves before going to university. Was he so foolish in those days? He didn't think so, but it bothered him that he couldn't remember for sure. Ewart was at the snow-piled fence now, and he still hadn't unslung his rifle musket or drawn his fighting knife, or that skinny elvish dagger that he thought Dunbridge didn't know he kept up his sleeve. He was only a few yards behind the elves, conversational distance, and they still hadn't spotted him. And as his comrades watched in amazement, Corporal Tommy Ewart scooped up a handful of snow, packed it into a ball, stood up, and lobbed it right at the nearest elf. The snowball arced over, as pretty a shot as any royal trooper's arrow, or a mortar shell launched at a fort, and struck the young elf right on the back of his pretty blonde head. All four elves stood and whirled to face Ewart. Saying what you would about their soldierly instincts, there was nothing wrong with their reflexes. Hands went to hills or to crossbow slings, 
but froze there when they saw the human soldiers standing there looking at them. Before any of them could work up the courage to do anything too foolish, Ewan raised his arm and motioned for the rest of his patrol to rise up out of concealment. Through his field glasses, Dunbush could see the owl's long, slanted eyes widen at the sight of a half-dozen bayoneted rifles suddenly pointing in their direction. Now Ewart was unslinging his own rifle and setting it aside, propped against a frost-clad fence post. He motioned for the nearest elf, the one he'd hit with a snowball to do the same with his crossbow. That elf had moved his hand away from his weapon sling when he'd seen the patrol aiming at him, but now, with Ewart's encouragement and making no sudden moves, he noticed he stood his crossbow off his back and set it against the big stone he'd been kneeling on earlier. Ewart nodded at that, then bent down and scooped up another handful of snow, patted it into a loose ball, and sidearmed it at the young elf. The snowball caught the fellow square in the chest in a puff of powdery flakes, leaving a dusting of white on the tan of his heavy woolen jacket. The elf looked down at the snow on his breast, then back at Ewart, cocking his head like a curious puppy. Corporal Ewart motioned at the snow beside the elf, then tapped his own chest and held his arms wide in an unmistakable gesture. Now you hit me. The elvish soldier's eyes flicked nervously between Ewart and those deadly rifles aiming down the slope, but as the corporal repeated his hit me gestures, the elf finally made a snowball of his own and caught back his hand to throw it. He paused, looking up at the patrol. To Dunbridge, it was like the elf was staring him right in the eyes despite the distance. The sub-lieutenant held out a hand. Hold your fire, men, he ordered. Port arms. You sure about that, sir? Grisby asked. No, but I'm hopeful. Port arms. Dunbridge didn't bother to look away from his field glasses to make sure they obeyed. He could tell by the rustle of cloth and clatter of sling swivels that rifles were coming down off shoulders. And besides, they were good soldiers. The elf with the snowball, seeing the guns no longer aimed at him, grinned lopsidedly like a schoolboy who had just discovered a new means of frightening the school mom. More confident now, he wound up and flung the snowball right into Ewart's face, hard enough to knock his hat clean off his head. Seriously, what's that idiot think he's doing? Walcott demanded again, wonder tinging his voice. He's starting a snowball fight? This was from Rifleman Stanthorpe, who joined the squad as a replacement only a few months before and claimed to be 19, but was almost certainly at least two years younger than that. In wartime, Imperial recruiters weren't what you'd call picky. If a lad was big enough and motivated, they didn't pry. You would wipe the snow off his face, shaking his head ruefully as he bent to pick up his kepi. That back on his head, he motioned for the other elves to follow their comrade's lead, set aside their weapons, and take up a snowball instead. To say there was no trepidation on the elves' part would be wrong, but once Hewitt began pelting them with snowballs of his own to speed them along, and once they saw their buddy scooping up snowballs to throw back at him, they were soon fully engaged. Snowballs zipped back and forth, the elves using their superior numbers to flank Hewitt and catch him in a crossfire. His kepi was soon knocked off again. The breeze carried a sound at Dunbridge that he'd never heard before, and it took him a moment to identify. In all the time he'd known Hewitt, in all the long months they'd marched and camped and fought together, he never heard the young man laugh. A chuckle here and there, a snicker at some ironic misfortune, but never before now full-throated joyous laughter. He's gone daft, he has, sighed Grimsby. Dunbridge let the field glasses hang. He shut his eyes and tilted back his head, feeling the winter sun on his face and listening to that distant laughter. Ewards, and the melodious liquid giggling of Elvish voices too. No, he said, focusing on that laughter and thinking of better times. He is engaging the enemy. Unbidden, his lips began to turn up in a slow smile. No, sir, he's daft, Grimsby insisted. He was a year or two younger than Ewart, and for the first time in a long while, he sounded it. The silly ass has let himself get outnumbered and outflanked. He turned to look at the sub-lieutenant. Sir, permission to go and support the corporal? There was a seldom heard eagerness in Grimsby's normally dour voice. In spite of the brisk chill in the air, the sun was warm on Dunbridge's face. Not everything must be cold and harsh in winter, he realised. Soldier arms, he ordered. The patrol will advance to the meadow, form snowballs, and reinforce Corporal Ewart's position. As he watched his soldiers race down ahead of him and get stuck into the snowball singing fray, as he heard the increasing peals of laughter, 
The cat calls in both Imperial Common and Elvish, flying back and forth. The thud of wet snow and the cries of comical dismay from World Place hits. Dunbridge was composing the after action report for the regimental log in his mind. Patrol of 2268. Engaged Elvish Fatigue Party four miles southwest of Infraidal Village. After a brief exchange, both sides withdrew without casualties. There was a high yelp as Oxy took a well thrown sludge ball right in the wedding tackle. Dunbridge amended his mental report to with minor casualties. He stuck his cold pipe back between his teeth and propped up against a fence post. Carbine held Lucy in one hand and using his field glasses to keep watching the tree line. Because there was a war going on, after all, and somebody had to stand watch. Somebody had to be a grown up. But for now, one grown up would be enough. Let the lads have their fun, human and elf alike. The war would still be there tomorrow. They could get back to the business of killing each other then. For now, for today, for however long this one strange moment of peace might last, he could just let them all be boys in the snow. <laughs>